12 things that men need to do, or you could say married men, in order to avoid adultery. This can be a very sensitive topic, and so you may be asking the question, why am I doing this video? Well, adultery is a big spiritual problem in the church. If you're going to be a mature Christian, this is one thing that you need to overcome to become mature in your faith. Secondly, I believe that secrecy is a devil's playground. The more secret we are about the topic, the more victim the devil will have. And so I would like to join the voice in exposing some of the wrongs and some of the things that the devil used to get us to fall temptation to this particular sin. My third reason for doing this video is that I realize that no one of us have all the wisdom to overcome. And so I'm hoping that this video will contribute to the information that will help someone, including you, to overcome the question and the matter of adultery. This video is not about bashing anyone or trying to beat a pan over your head. It's about helping you to overcome and giving you useful information that you can utilize not only to help yourself, but to help others. This is your Devotional Digest, and I am Damian Chambers. This channel is geared towards helping you to grow spiritually. If you're watching for the first time, feel free to subscribe to the channel so you can keep up to date with what's happening. This particular video is specifically for married Christian men, but of course, it can benefit all men, including and also women, and married women in particular, to help your husband or to even help themselves to overcome this particular challenge. Thanks for joining and welcome. Now, just before I begin, I want to let you know that I've been married for 14 years now, happily married as, as far as I know, to my beautiful wife, and we are in love with each other. I'm still attracted to her, and I work hard to keep, we work hard to keep the marriage going, and I want to share from my experience something that can help you. There are two things I want to address before we begin getting into the 12 things to overcome adultery. Number one, what is adultery? And number two, the dangers of adultery. So according to the Bible and the dictionary, adultery is basically when a married person has sexual relations with individuals who are not their spouse. That could be physical as well as emotional sexual relation. And the Bible speaks, while the Bible condemns adultery, it also speaks to the dangers that one faces when they commit adultery, especially the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs have a lot to say. It is too much for me to cover in this video alone because of what the video is focusing on. I would encourage you to read from Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7. It has a lot to say about adultery. When I, when I went through it, this, to sum it up, the idea is that the one who commits adultery is going to self-destruct. That's basically the essence of what Proverbs is saying. One of the reasons that Proverbs give as to why adultery leads to self-destruction is that it's basically saying that you're going to waste your life. And to make it practical, you know, adultery can lead to having children out of wedlock. And so when you, when you have a situation like that, you're going to work your head off, not only for one family, but for two or three or four. You know, I am finding it challenging to manage one family financially. And can you imagine if you have two or three to, mar to manage? Something that the Bible says include, it says, okay, as we go along, feel free to share your thoughts in the comment below as to what you could add to the list, what you could take away, and so on. I, I welcome your comments. All right, let's go. Okay, so the first thing that men need to do to avoid adultery is to be in love with their wives and let it show. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, reading from verse 15, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and, waters of, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. 
Let her be as a loving hide and pleasant robe. And this is my favorite part. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. In other words, keep yourself only unto her so long as you both shall live. Don't be ashamed of her and to identify with her in public. Don't criticize her because that destroys her value in your sight. And keep doing the things that you did to win her attention in the first place. Those special attention, spending time with her, you know, hugging her and making her feel special. Be in love with your wife and let it show. The second advice I'll give for married men is that you must let your wife be your best friend. This is in connection with the first one. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That gives the idea of detachment in order to attach. And it says father and mother here, but I would include other relationships that we must drop or demote in favor of this primary relationship in your life. Marriage is a lifelong friendship. I like to look at it that way. And a friend is someone you spend time with, someone you do things with, someone you share, you share conversations. When you get a nice joke, you share it with them. Someone you look forward to. Share everything, everything new you learn in life, you want to share with that person. That's how you nurture a friendship. And once you do that, it is much more difficult to go elsewhere looking for love. This leads me to the third advice I'll give to married men, and that is to avoid having any special friend or special sister or special mother or special um, daughter. Any special relationship with a female outside your wife must be with your siblings or with your family or relatives. But outside of that, when you have relationships and label them as, you know, my little daughter or my little sister, what that does, it gives permission to bypass the rules. And so, you know, it, it sometimes it, it, it reduces your spouse vigilance towards this relationship because, hey, this is... This is someone you're mentoring. This is somebody you have a special relationship with. So you, you, you're get, given permission to spend more time with them on the phone and so on. This can be dangerous. And so you want to avoid doing that. We're going to, another advice will show you what you can do to overcome that. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 2, Treat the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Notice the Apostle Paul is punching that line in there. Yes, you have sisters in the church, but the relationship you have towards them must be with all purity. This brings me to the third advice, which is connected to the previous one. And that is keep work relationships professional. The advice I'm giving you here is not for you to forsake all female or forsake all contact with women. The advice is to avoid adultery. And so, of course, in your work, in your ministry, in your daily interaction, you will have to work with female. Now, how do you do that in order to avoid feelings or relationship developing that are unwholesome? Well, as I said, you keep it professional. So the idea is that your interaction with a person is for the purpose of getting work done, and that's it. So your phone calls, your conversations at work the aim is to get your work done and there are some things you can avoid you can can do to avoid feelings from developing because there's a law of bonding that suggests that once you spend long hours with somebody who of the opposite sex especially of similar age alone feelings can develop so what you can do is to avoid spending long times alone you can be alone without being private about it so, for example, if, you, if you're counseling somebody, you can make sure that um, while persons may not be hearing what you're saying, at least they are seeing you and they are aware that you are with somebody inside your office offering counseling. So, at the end of the day, keep it professional. Advice number five is that I would advise you to trust your wife's judgment. What I mean by that is that both male and female seek love and appreciate love in different ways. And so we tend to have a blind side to when the opposite sex is approaching us. And therefore, 
if your wife raises concern about someone coming on to you, then listen to her. Don't just dismiss it as if it's not important. You know, your wife may say to you, listen, why are you spending too much time dropping home this young lady? That's a red flag. So you, you immediately pay attention to it. Of course, unless your spouse is overprotective and abusive, that would be a, a case for a professional help. Um, some unique situations may be, it could also be that maybe you would have been guilty of adultery before and that would lead to trust factors. When adultery has taken place within a marriage, it will take professional help to start the healing process and will take some special interventions and actions even outside of the advice I'm giving you now to bring about healing and to restore trust. In those situations, it may be that you will have to be accountable to your wife for every move you make. That's beyond the scope of this presentation. I'm just pointing out in a normal setting, if your wife raises questions about a relationship, listen to her. Because sometimes we are blindsided to those situations. She can see a situation from afar that you may not see. Just as how you could see situations that she might be blindsided to. Advice number six is that I would encourage you to avoid staying away from each other for long and extended periods of time. You know, for example, one person have to work away for six, nine months, you know. Um, those can put pressure on a relationship or even living in two different locations permanently. My thing is that it's not that it's impossible to happen, but these arrangements should be temporary. Maybe some things can happen in life, but it should be temporary working towards getting together eventually. Because the truth is that marriage depends on intimacy, and intimacy doesn't only involve sexual relationship. It involves spending time together, managing the home together, spending the money together, raising the children together, you know, making mistakes together and stuff. When you live apart, you deprive yourself and your spouse the opportunity to grow together. And so when you're apart, you're going to grow apart because you're going to depend less on each other emotionally and start becoming attached to other people around you. And so I'd recommend what the Bible says, leave and cleave. That involves being together most, if not all the time. The next advice I'll give to you, gentlemen, is to recognize your vulnerability. In other words, never say to yourself, this can never happen to me, because such spiritual pride will lead to a fall. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let me tell you something. Sin has no special friend. It doesn't respect your prof profession. It doesn't respect your position. It doesn't make respect your role. So always be aware of the possibilities of what can happen and keep your guards up at all times because all of us, given the right opportunity, can be guilty of the worst sin that you can think of. So let's be on our guard and never trust in yourself. Put your trust in God and his strength. And therefore, do not put yourself on a limb. Do not put yourself in dangerous situations willingly, thinking that because of your strength and experience you can overcome. Next advice up on the list is for you to avoid flirting. According to the dictionary, flirting is to behave as though sexually attracted to someone but playfully rather than with serious intentions. In other words, joking around about your, in, your, your attraction towards somebody. Those compliment, those prolonged conversations, those regular visits or expected phone calls towards somebody who is not your spouse. That's flirting. Sometimes this is a habit that you develop while you're young. As, as a young man, you, 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 that's, a, that's a habit. You know, some persons have the personality of being outgoing and they can easily whip up a conversation and so on. But it doesn't matter your personality. Flirting is flirting. In this book, Letters to Young Lovers, the author in page 74 says something very interesting. She says, To trifle with hearts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy God. 
and yet some will show preference for young ladies and call out their affections and then go their way and forget all about the words they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words, devote one another the same attentions. This disposition will reveal itself in the married life. The marriage relation does not always make the fickle mind firm, the wavering steadfast and true to principle. The terror of constancy and un unholy thoughts will manifest themselves in, un in unholy actions. In other words, if you practice flirting before marriage, you will practice flirting in the marriage and it becomes dangerous. My experience is that once I gave my special attention to the young lady who is now my wife, I took the decision not to give that same attention to any other young lady, even though we are not married. Because for me, it was a pledge, it was a commitment, and it demonstrates honesty. So I'd say to you, if, if you are practicing flirting before, stop it. There is no negotiation if you're a married man. Stop flirting. Advice number nine I would give to married men is that if feelings develop for somebody, for some reason or the other, it, it is possible, and I should have said this at the start, that if feelings develop for somebody, it's not a sin. Just like temptation is not a sin. It's how you respond to that that makes a difference. So if that happens, the first thing you want to do is to be honest with yourself, be honest to God, and in some cases, be honest with your spouse. How do you know that you have special feeling for somebody? Some of the red flags include when you begin to make excuses for wanting to be alone with this person, when you begin to make excuses for wanting to have conversation with a person or make excuses for wanting to be around a person. Those are some indications that you may have special feeling for this person. How do you respond to this? The first thing, as I said, is to be honest. The second thing is to pray about it. Talk to God about it because it is a temptation to sin. So present it to God just like you would do any other temptation. Confess how you feel. Acknowledge it to God and he can bring healing to your heart. The other thing to, to note is that that is evidence of some type of bonding taking place. And bonding, based upon what the professional says, cannot be reversed. You can only stop it. So, stop it. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. In, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, it says, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that no, one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So just break off the special attention. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean that you're not going to relate to the person. It's just that you're going to stop the special attention. You relate to the person as required to get your job done or to get things done, but not any special phone call, prolonged, spending prolonged time on the phone and so on. Advice number 10 is that you need to watch out for relationships that you had before you got married. Jamaican people would say, you need to watch out for old fire stick rekindling. <laughs> All right? So many things that you can do to avoid this is to first let your spouse know about these relationships. You know, as marriage counselors, that's one thing we usually ask couples who are planning to get married. What other relations have you had before you get into the marriage? And what the relationship you have with this person? Sometimes children might be involved in those cases, again, you're going to relate to the person in a professional way. Whatever relating you have to do, you do it for the sake of accomplishing what you have to get done, but not to have those type of conversations that you had before. Because as I said in the previous advice, bonding cannot be reversed. So the temptation is that once you see this person, you're going to want to pick up from where you left off. So you have to be more on guard with this person than anybody else because there's a bonding that's there so again you want to keep conversation business like and try to avoid being alone with this person my next advice is for you to try your best to avoid sexual famine sexual famine has to do with starving your spouse or your spouse starving you of sex the bible condemned this practice in first corinthians chapter 7 Reading from verse 3, the Bible says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except 
it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So any type of break outside of the regular healthy breaks is must be with consent if you're giving yourself to fasting and prayer but otherwise you come back so that you are not put in a vulnerable situation now how to avoid sexual famine keep your relationship up to date <laughs> i like to put it that way manage conflicts promptly and thoroughly one of the things that keep couples from having sexual relationships healthy sexual relationships is when they are not talking to each other when there are unresolved conflicts so one of the most important things i mentioned in my video on highly effective marriage is for you to manage conflicts properly my thing is that the bible says the sun should not go down on your anger so deal with your conflicts and bring back that love and keep it there consistently and listen, people talk about being married for 14 years, 10 years. This is something you have to do on a daily basis in order to be successful. To avoid sexual famine, also you need to avoid sleeping in another room. You know, some couples, sometimes it starts out innocent. Sometimes for, for the sake of, you know, putting the children to sleep, you sleep in, the, in their room and then um, it becomes a habit. You know, I am very jealous about that. <laughs> You know, if my wife go and sleep on the floor, I'm going on the floor too. You know, so avoid those things. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27 verse 7, One who is full hates honey <laughs> or despises honey, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. In other words, sexual famine will cause your spouse to be vulnerable. It will cause you to be vulnerable to sexual temptation. So avoid it. Finally, Advice number 12 is for you to avoid pornography or sin saturation. If you're addicted to pornography, you'll be even more vulnerable to sexual temptation. Pornography or consuming pornographic content will lead to unwholesome fantasies and, and expectations of your spouse and really cause you to get your sexual desires distorted. So if you're addicted, stop. <laughs> I have no other advice to give than to stop. But the Bible says, if you're right and offend, you'll cut it off. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 27 to 28 says, um, You have heard it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if a man look on a woman to lust after her in his, in his heart, he is committing adultery. So pornography leads you to commit adultery with a lot of women. Job 31 verse 1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? And Proverbs 6, 25 says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Avoid being drawn away with sexually explicit content. Enjoy your wife because she is enough for you. So, adultery destroys. It destroys relationship. It is deadly. It, it destroys your life. So these advice are not joy killers. They are helpers for you to enjoy a healthy and happy marriage. After 14 years of marriage, I can tell you it does work. It's the best way to go about it. And I'm not saying here that if you make mistakes, that all is lost. As I said, through professional help, with working together, you can overcome. But by God's grace, I pray that you, through these 12 lessons, will be guarded and if you as i said before if you have any comments about any of the advice or anyone you would add or take away please post in the chat and don't forget to subscribe to this channel as we continue to build uplifting content to help you grow spiritually god bless you and thank you so much for watching